new murder investigation from the case files of Lieutenant Joe Kenda. Say something! An explosion of rage on the open road. What's up now? It's up to Kenda and his team to catch the killer before the situation boils over. When you're dealing with a potentially harmed suspect, you want to arrest him outside. If you try to take him in a house, he knows where his weapons are and you don't. Near the right rear passenger door. 
the window was shattered, so some gunfire went through that window, which of course shot Mr. Terry and also shot Mr. Pickett.
So we're investigating a drive-by shooting. We know that there's been a disturbance that led to this shooting. So what's up? What's up? No! Come on, help! We know that Dan Lee Terry is dead. And I also know that Earl Pickett's not completely truthful with me. What I don't know is who's in this other car. And that's our focus now. to this fast food restaurant and we see if any of the regulars are around. How you doing? Just fine, officers. How are y'all doing? Were you here earlier tonight? Huh? He tells me he's a regular and he, he was here and he's been here all evening. What's your name? Playboy. That's what they call me. Playboy. He thinks by calling himself Playboy, he can attract girls. Well, all right then. How's that working out for you? All right, Playboy. We understand that this uh, place had a bit of a crowd earlier tonight. They were here to see me. I was supposed to fight this dude who crossed me. You worked that out. Watch him take down his rival. You want something you mess with the Playboy? The Playboy! They're all anticipating that this fight's going to happen. They're adrenaline's bump, and they want to see what's going to happen in this fight. He's not here! But the other guy never showed up, obviously out of fear of Playboy, and so therefore he's the winner. Can it happen after that? Not really. Bull****. What, the guy's in the white car? Listen, we know there was a fight here tonight. Oh, that one. Some dude with braids started getting into it. Those people in the car. One of the guys came out of it, and he took it out of the The guy who he describes as in the right front seat goes to the trunk, takes out a handgun, and cocks it. Well, my opinion is that's our man Earl, brandishing his 380 auto that is the motor. He didn't shoot it, he just thought everybody was scattered. They got back in the car and left. This guy with braids, you know his name? Yeah. Never seen before. Playboy doesn't really know these people. Either side, he doesn't know Earl Pickett, he doesn't know anybody else. Thanks a lot for having your help. Yeah, no problem. The conversation with Playboy proves Kenda's hunch that Earl Pickett hasn't been telling him the truth. But it doesn't get Kenda any closer to identifying the shooter. Now his only hope lies with Van Terry's siblings. So now I think there's enough time for Jan to settle about the loss of her brother. Hi. Hey, Dawn. Might if we come in and talk to you about what happened? Okay. She tells me about the family and that Van has gone back to college to take care of this new child he has in his life. She's still very distraught about the loss. She repeats what is said by Earl, most of it. She says that the disturbance happens at the restaurant some guy made some slick comment to me. Like he was trying to make my friend mad. It's a black guy with blue rubber bands in his hair. Come on. So what's up? What's up? Come on, no, let's go. Let's get out of here. We didn't try to start anything. What? That guy, he initiated everything. We got out of there as fast as we could. What about the gun? What about it? She knew that he was in the military. And just something as simple as that. Uh, to get him in a lot of trouble, so she was trying to protect him. After pursuing her a bit, she admits that Earl did go to the trunk of the car and take out a gun and brandish the gun. That's what initiates the shooting that happened a short time later. About the car that fired on you guys when you were driving down flat, did you get a good look at it? No, not the license plate. It was just a dark car with tinted windows, and the back window was down behind the driver's side thing she's told me that I find interesting is the shooter is in the back seat of the suspect car and somebody else is driving. There's more than one person involved in a shooting. 
Again, we're starting to realize. Detectives now know the shooter had at least one accomplice, but their identities remain a mystery. So Kenda reaches out to another potential source of information, his fellow Colorado Springs police officers. Whenever police question an individual or suspect about one crime, we sometimes wind up intercepting information about another. That's because criminals often can't help but brag to one another about what they've done, even the killers. It isn't long before Kenda catches a break. What's up? Hey, Lieutenant. We receive information from one of our robbery detectives that while working on another investigation, this confidential informant is able to tell him he has some information about a murder that occurred in Colorado Springs. So the CI says he's talking to this guy about this burglary, and the guy tells him that before they did the burglary, they were involved in this argument at the fast food place downtown. And they shot up a car right after that. Well, no. So he tells me we need to talk to this guy. Mike did the burglary. Mike's partners did the shooting. Confidential informants operate on a cash basis. They sell information. There is no loyalty among bad guys. None whatsoever. They would roll over on their own mother if it was to their advantage. The detective tells Kenda that operating on the tip from their informant, his men found a cache of stolen goods in the home of a man named Mike Phillips and arrested him an hour ago. Let's go talk to him. It's an odd thing, but it happens all the time. You have a murder case that is absolutely at a dead stop, and one little piece of information comes into your hands, and now we are hitting on all cylinders, and I'm feeling pretty good. all this way in this case without much good solid information and now we have an informant who's telling us about a burglary the burglary in question mike edmonds supposedly has the scoop on kenda's drive-by shooting and he's already in custody we can flush mike down a toilet and the only thing that's going to save him i'll give you the killers you gotta let me walk on these robberies Evidence for you, hard time for this If you tell us what you know, there is at least a chance that some judge might look kindly upon you when it comes time to sentence you. All right, fine, I'll talk. But I had nothing to do with this. I just overheard my boys talking shit about it. He explains that before conducting this burglary, he met up with two friends who helped him in burglary. There were Matt Corman and Ronnie Bullock. You heard there was a drive-by earlier. That was all. Yeah, that's me and Ronnie, son. According to Mike Edmonds, Matt and Ronnie told him they were in the car with a shooter. A man by the name of Robert Ziegler. Who was the driver? They settled some girl named Sue Klein. She's Robert's girlfriend. Robert. Robert Ziegler. What's Ziegler's hair look like? He's got little knots in his head and he ties them with blue rubber bands. Really. So now... Our man, who in the past was only known to us by the color of those bands, is Robert Ziegler. Is so Robert Ziegler? Is that on parole? Robert Ziegler is 23 years of age, and he has been arrested 36 times in the last few years. 36 times. He's actually on parole. That's something to our advantage, because a person on parole has to make routine contact with their parole officers. Yes, can I speak to Mr. Anthony, please? His parole officer, Tony Anthony, considers Robert a major offender and he pays attention to him. So he becomes crucial in finding him for us immediately. Okay, we'll meet you at 4 p.m. sharp. Thanks. We'll get the fugitive apprehension team ready. Uh, what's the rendezvous point? Within hours, Kenda has the CSPD SWAT team assembled just a few blocks from Robert Ziegler's house. Here's what we're going to do. When you're dealing with a potentially armed suspect, you want to arrest him outside. If you try to take him in a house, he knows where his weapons are and you don't. With the help of Ziegler's parole officer, Tony Anthony, Kenda has devised a plan to lure Ziegler out of his house. We're going to let Anthony make contact. His parole officers make unannounced visits. 
so he would not be alarmed by the appearance of Mr. Anthony. Okay, so I knock on the door and tell him I need to talk to him outside? That's right, as soon as he's outside, we we'll get the ghost signal, he's catching the ground. The last thing I said to everybody, remember, pay attention. All right, this guy's probably got a gun, so be extra safe. Do what you know how to do. I don't want to lose anybody to Robert Singer. Okay, Anthony, go ahead and make contact. Whoa, don't, don't mess things up. Mess things 
Yeah. My desk has stuff everywhere. I knew where everything was, but it literally was everywhere. It's Kendall. I hope you're right there. Get to this case. We just got double homicide. Let's go. Kenta heads over to the Western Meadows Mobile Home Park, a part of town rarely visited by the major crimes unit. How you doing? So what do we got? What's up here in the driveway? Multiple gunshot wounds. 20-year-old man from Carroll. Pronounced it dead. Anthony Carroll had just moved to Colorado eight months earlier to be closer to his older brother, Melvin. And the other victim, there's a young female in the bathtub. She's got multiple wounds in her chest, and they say she's got several in one leg. So how many gunshot wounds did she have? Uh, none. She was stabbed. Really? It's very unusual for one perpetrator to use two different weapons. Who is she? Uh, she's Cherry Bradley. She's also 20 years old. Uh, she's the girlfriend of the victim in the driveway. Sherry had a baby that was 16 months, a little girl, and she had chosen to move in. Presents Kenda with a grim but familiar scenario. When you have two people who have been dating and now both are dead, it, it almost always is a murder-suicide. Did Anthony Carroll stab her to death in the bathtub? Walk outside and shoot himself? <laughs> Two gunshot wounds in his chest, one in the head. Well, that certainly takes away suicide. No one shoots themselves five times, particularly twice in the head. Somebody shot him to death, and somebody stabbed Sherry Bradley to death. The question is, who is that? Any suspects so far? Uh, yeah, actually. Excellent. When the officers started arriving, the initial suspect was out in the front yard area. Uh, he was agitated and crying. He also had uh, high-velocity blood spatter on his shirt, so we just loaded him up and took him downtown. Good work, J.J. Yeah, who is he? Melvin Carroll, he owns the house, and uh, the victim in the driveway, Anthony, is his little brother. Violence between family members is not rare. You would think it would be. You would think that people are not going to kill the ones they love, but yeah, they will. About 25% of crimes in this country are committed by family members. Could Melvin have killed his brother and his brother's girlfriend in a twisted, jealous rage? There was an extreme amount of blood, and then there was brain matter along with blood where his head had laid. I noticed that there are small areas of blood coming out of that house, and the teardrop shape indicates forward motion. So someone's going outside, and they're bleeding while they're doing it. it Looks like he was shot at least once inside. Came out here. Headshot and dropped. So the killer fell. Appears that way. Let's head inside. Watch your stuff. This is a very well maintained private home. There's a place for everything and everything in this place. Freshly vacuumed. It is immaculate. Which draws your attention to this object laying on the floor in the living room. The blood covered knife. Hey Josh. It's a kitchen knife. Is there anything missing? Yep. Hard to say. It's a weapon of opportunity. Whoever did this didn't bring a knife with them to do this. Make sure you mark that. They obtained the knife there. Strange place to put a murder weapon. You discover two weapons in a crime scene. Your first instinct is two different bad guys. Now it makes it doubly difficult to determine who's responsible. This is a really, really tidy house. That's why the phone on the floor. Blood winds its way through the home. There is more blood, smears on the wall, and blood on a carpet leading back into the master bedroom in this trailer. Look at that. Somebody kicked in that door. Anthony was in here and Melvin was trying to get at him? Well, right now, that'd be my guess. Yeah, look. There is a bullet hole in the door frame of this master bedroom. So whoever gets shot in there, which is no doubt Anthony, gets up. Now he is moving all the way through the trailer. Melvin finishes off Anthony up front. Well, somebody does. Crime scenes tell you what happened. It doesn't tell you who made it happen. Kenda and Hendricks now have an idea how Anthony 
was killed, but his girlfriend Cherie's death remains a mystery. When you expect this scene, the next obvious thing to do is to look in the bathroom. There's quite a bit of blood. A half inch deep or so in the tub. That blade's going through heart, lungs, all sorts of things. It do major bleeding. Poor Sherry had been stabbed and stabbed and stabbed again. Wait, she was stabbed what? 16, 17 times? Yeah. I'm a professional. I see human remains. I see evidence of violence. I see it all the time. She had the shower curtain underneath her. And she was standing, the attacker pushed her backwards. She's not surprised. It's a frontal attack. Then she was stabbed repeatedly while she was down on her back. She's taking stabbing injuries to her fingers and her hands to try to stop this person from stabbing her. I think uh, Brother Melvin might have been in love with Sherry. That's the kind of love she could have done without. This is absolutely a question her. Multiple wounds, rage attack, everything about it says personal. With still so many unanswered questions, Kenda heads outside to speak with potential witnesses. Back here. This is Victoria Carroll. She's the wife of the guy who took downtown. She says she was inside when everything started. <laughs> I left and went to the neighbor's house as soon as I heard the scream. Yes. Yeah. Deep breath. Victoria is 25 years of age. She's holding the daughter of Sherry Bradley. She is incredibly traumatized, but I need to know what happened here. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you some difficult questions. Sometimes if you ask somebody an accusatory question, particularly against the loved one of theirs. They'll blurt out what they know. So I said to her, Tell me about your husband, Melvin. He killed his own brother and killed Sherry. That's not what happened. Really? Well, my, my, my. So we arrive at this confused, horrific scene of dead people, all involving family members, Melvin is the obvious suspect who is probably responsible for at least the death of Anthony. Could he also be responsible for Sherry? You got it all wrong. That was not my husband, Melvin. He didn't kill Sherry Bradley. Anthony did. Victoria explains that Anthony had a history of emotional problems. He developed a pretty good drug habit, wound up making a suicide attempt, and at that point, his dad said, you know, hey, do me a favor. You gotta help me straighten him out. He's your brother. And so Melvin said, okay, and took this burden on. Anthony got a job. He got an apartment. His new girlfriend, Sherry, moved in with him. But then over a relatively short period of time, Anthony began to spiral again. Victoria explains that Sherry Bradley has moved in with them and has been staying there because she broke up with Anthony, that they've been having serious problems. She just wanted to stay for a couple of days before she get on the plane to Illinois. She was supposed to leave tomorrow. But Victoria tells Kenda that around 6 o'clock last night, Anthony showed up at their door. Victoria explains that Anthony was not invited over, but he came over. Man, I'm in trouble here. You know what I'm talking about? That's why I say about Sherry and the baby. We knew he shouldn't have been around. But since Sherry and the baby was leaving tomorrow, we decided to let him in. I have to keep cool. I promise. Anthony comes in. They watch the game for a little while, and everything seems to be fine. Sherry gets up to go to the bathroom. All of a sudden, Anthony gets up, follows her into the bathroom. Victoria looked at that and thought that was odd. Moments later, Victoria noticed that something else was amiss. Hey, babe, have you seen the carbon knife? It's in the butcher's block, where it always is. It most certainly is not. Thanks, babe. Now, get out of here. Hurry, hurry up, hurry. Now, she told me to get the baby and run to the neighbor's house. Victoria comes across as very believable. She's not trying to protect anybody. She's not trying to minimize anybody's behavior. Every story has a beginning, and violence in that bathroom is what initiates this whole process. Can I take a deputy district attorney with me to talk to Melvin? Because I truly... So I want 
with that DA there because he's in a position as the deputy district attorney to make the decision to not place Melvin in custody. Melvin is nervous, he is cooperative, he's frightened. Melvin's the district attorney. He wants to get your side of the story as well. Tell us what happened here, and he does. When I heard Sheriff scream, I ran down the hall. He goes to the bathroom door and he locked it.
There's one thing that never changes. Murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. It's Monday morning. moment for a high school senior. Monday morning, 6 o'clock, time to go to school, rolls out of bed. Hey, little dudes. Come on, it's time to get up. Come on. You're the oldest brother, and your younger brothers depend on you. It was important to him to make sure that his younger brothers were taken care of. As his younger brothers wake up, Bill hunts for something to wear. Hey, Mom, have you seen my red sweater? Hey, Mom! And he's not getting an answer from her, and this is beginning to get under his skin, and so... So Bill goes into his parents' bedroom looking for his mother, doesn't see her. Mom. But he hears the shower running. Mom sees the steam coming out and thinking, okay, my mom's in there taking a shower. Assuming his mother simply can't hear him, Bill pokes his head into the bathroom. And then he found something that he would never want to find. He sees his mom and thinks maybe she's knocked herself unconscious and then realizes that she's not moving at all. Across town, Lieutenant Joe Kenda is busy going about his own morning routine. Hey, Cass, you see my yellow tie? Oh, I had to throw it away. It was covered in blood. You wind up with blood in your clothes. You wind up with all kinds of things in your clothes. So you are cheap suits in this line of work because you wind up throwing in the dumpsters all the time. Then, just as Kenda is about to take his first bite of pancakes... receives an all-too-familiar call. It's Kenda. I know who it is. I answered the phone. I said, I'll be right there. Calling right to the chair. Half an hour later, Kenda arrives at a house on a cul-de-sac in northeast Colorado Springs. This time of day, you have families getting kids out to school and families leaving to work. So they're kind of astonished to see law enforcement hanging out in their neighborhood. Hey, Lieutenant. Brian? So we got this early in the morning. 42-year-old Cheryl Brandner. She just found the bathtub by our three young children. She was a maternity nurse at Penrose Hospital. I mean, here was this lovely little family, and now the mom is gone. Where's that? He had already left for work. I still hasn't been told yet. So we're thinking this is an accident and I'm still the phone. I think so. As far as we can tell so far, yeah. Let's take a look. Patrol responded to this call, and they called for us because they're not sure what happened here. The first thing Kenda and his men notice is the location of the body. A bathroom is usually the most dangerous room in your house. There's all kinds of things in there that can hurt you and might even kill you. But the primary thing that goes wrong is you fall in the tub. A faint stain of blood is also present around the rim. I we take a closer look? Obviously bleeding from somewhere. Yeah. I don't see anything on the side. There are no other apparent wounds or injuries on her back. It's difficult to see it. See the cut over right eye? Yeah. Her 
probably looking at an accident. She obstructs the drain with her body, the water fills up and she drowns.
against him. You know, again, I'm very sorry about this. Uh, if you just stay here with the officers, I'll make sure you get your father back as soon as possible. And we are now left with the unenviable task of informing him that his wife is no longer alive. It's only 9 a.m. when Ken Ariane Welch escorts Kenda and Ritz to the wood shop on the first floor. Excuse me, Bob. There's someone outside that needs to talk with you. I'm in the middle of class. What's this about? I don't know, but it's urgent. Don't worry. I'll take over. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll be back. I've done this too many times. But a sharp knife cuts clean. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Mr. Brandner. But your wife is not dead this morning. That, that can't be. She was fine this morning. She was fine. What happened? Looks like she hit her head and drowned in the bathtub. We're still waiting for the exact cause of death from the corner. No. Sorry. So he is pretty distressed, of course, and we invite him to go to the teacher's lounge, which happens to be close by. Just then, Kenda gets a page from the coroner's office. I tell Ritz to go find a phone and call them and find out what the deal is. Yes. fractures to various veins and arteries resulting in good vibe. So if she did fall and hit her head, probably wouldn't inflict that much damage. And that's exactly what he's saying. The victim had been struck repeatedly. Yeah. Now the game changes because it wasn't just falling and hitting her head on this tub. She died of multiple blows to the head. So that's not really something you do to yourself. The coroner will rule this as a homicide and not an accidental death. Which means Bob Brandner isn't just a grieving husband, he's also a potential suspect. Obviously, Bob has a lot of questions to answer. I transport Bob down to the police operations center for the purpose of an interview. I'm relieved at that point from that to go back to the scene to conduct further investigation into the crime scene. Now we're looking for signs that might explain the blunt force trauma. Meanwhile, back at the school, Kenda has a few more questions for Mary Ann Welch. How long have you uh, worked with Mr. Brandner? I've known him over 10 years. I know him by Cheryl and her three boys. They're all wonderful people. Father. But he's a Boy Scout leader. He is a dedicated public school teacher. He is Mr. Middle America. As he leaves, Kenda asks Marianne to help him with one more thing. Do you know where his car is or what kind of car it is? So she describes it to me and tells me where it's parked. Nine minutes later, Kenda's forensic officers are searching Bob's truck. They have the means to open a locked vehicle without difficulty. So we're in the car. Take the glove apartment. Is there any papers? Yes. It's the usual stuff we all have. Registration, proof of insurance, some receipts. Something unusual catches Kenda's attention. So I read the first two lines. I just have to write you to tell you how happy I am. I love you with all my heart, now and forever. Looks like a love letter. It is. I don't think it's from his wife. It's signed LDZ. You cannot contrive Cheryl out of LDZ. Now who the hell are you? Cheryl Ann Brandner was discovered dead, face down in a bathtub. Police say it wasn't an accident, and the three children there, aged 11 through 18, are key witnesses. 
while searching Bob's truck, I find a love letter from a female whose name isn't Cheryl L-D-Z. We clearly have a love triangle. We don't know where the other woman is. We possibly have a motive for killing. Could she have done it to get Bob? Could Bob have done it to get his new girlfriend? The forensic team continues searching Bob's truck, and it isn't long before they turn up more incriminating evidence. Hey, Lieutenant. What is it? It's a bloody sheet. Well, my, 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 Bob. What are you doing with these in your truck? It's now clear why the vet had been stripped so early in the morning. Can I come to Detective Ritz? Go ahead, Lieutenant. I'm headed back to the scene, but in the meantime, can you have CSI take a closer look at uh, Bob and Cheryl's bedroom? Uh, it appears that she was killed on the bed. Enforcement. Kendit makes the crosstown trip to the Brantner residence. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll talk to you in the bed, okay? Waiting for him is Detective Ritz, whose team continued to process the home while Ritz himself canvassed the neighborhood. The suspect. <laughs> I found the uh, love letter in the vehicle, signed with the initials LDZ. LDZ. Hang on a second, I, I got something for that. It sparks interest in me because I remember talking to somebody in the neighborhood that those initials fit. I check my notes. I'm able to show that this individual is Laura D. Searcher. She lives two doors down. She wasn't home, but the uh, the next door neighbor gave me her name. Well, looks like she's not. I go talk to her. Right. Excuse me, ma'am. What kind of camera? Can I ask you a few questions? When I talked to her, I saw her badge, and she's not real surprised, which I thought was interesting. Am I being questioned as a suspect? And my response is immediate. Is there a reason why I should be questioning you as a suspect? She says, no, no, I know. I've already heard what happened, so I figure you now know that Bob and I are an item. I never set out to have an affair with him. It just happened that way. You tell me about it. Laura explains that unlike Bob, she's divorced, raising two kids by herself. Her kids belong to the same Boy Scout troop his kids do. He's the leader of the troop. She's always admired him, but two years ago, it turned to be a romantic relationship. This was a long, slow, cultivated relationship. And who knows really what her ultimate goal is it appears that it probably was to marry bob she said last time she saw bob was that morning well that's interesting was that before or after Cheryl was dead i make lunches for him every day so he came by to pick it up was he acting strangely at all no he seemed normal to me right, we may have some questions for you later thank you kent is willing to accept half of laura zirchner's statement at face value just from a practical standpoint, Cheryl Brantner was a large woman. Laura is a little slip of a woman. It would be very, very difficult for her to overcome Cheryl in the first place and move her unconscious. So this whole pattern says to me, Laura is not part of it. Bob is. Bob's the only part. Excuse us for a second. A discovery in the bedroom further confirms Kenda's hunch. As I walk closer, it's a three foot length of two by four. It's got blood on it. It's the missing piece of the puzzle, and all he needs to finally bring this case to a close. They didn't find it initially because it had been stuffed behind that heavy wooden head. against him and he says listen i can explain well please do bob we had a big argument last night i told her that i met someone else and then i finally wanted a divorce cheryl we need to talk how did cheryl take that she was mad of course you're not happy i'm not happy our marriage is not working our okay? marriage is not working because you're out Stop. Stop. Regularly. Stop. 
She said she knew about the affair with Laura and that I wouldn't have the right to anything because I was cheating. So you snapped. Yeah, she was making threats. She wanted to make my life difficult. They decide to go to bed and talk about it in the morning. But in the morning, the fight continues. And Cheryl becomes so angry, she shoves Bob. Have you thought about anybody else besides you? So how would she get the injury on her head if she shoved you? I lost it. I lost it and, and shoved her back, and she hit her head on the, on the headboard and, and started bleeding. So he said she was disoriented, but she was alert and she was angry. She said, I'll take care of my head and just get out of here. So I left. I guess because she was out of it, she slipped in the shower and, and drowned. I think you forgot a few things. Would you like me to go over what I think you forgot? You get to have your whore. That's what you get. She just had her head in the bedstead, Bob. She hit it on a two by four that happened to be in your hand at the time. <laughs> you wheeled on her with that two by four and you killed her. That's why you took her nightgown off. And then stripped the bed so there was no blood evidence to be seen. Then put her in the tub, face down, started the walk in order to stage this looking like an accidental fall and a drowning. Those are some of the things you forgot. Stand up, put your hands behind your back. You're under arrest for murdering your wife. On February 18, 1994, Robert Brandner is found guilty of murder in the second degree and is sentenced to four years in prison. There's other ways to get out of a relationship. Murder is not the best one. Here is a man who leaves his three children to find their naked mother dead in a tub full of water. All because he wants someone new to make his lunch. This is why humans are so difficult to understand and so dangerous to behold. Coming up, the death of a young artist takes Kenda deep into the Colorado Springs statue scene. Ego can be helpful in terms of you maintaining a level of success, but too much ego can be destructive. <laughs> Officer Robert Beekler is patrolling the graveyard shift on the west side of Colorado Springs. It was October, early morning, actually, and the bars had been closed for an hour or so, and things seemed to be pretty quiet around town. Help me! Help me! Help me! The young woman's waving her arms as to get his attention. She's frantic. She's not him what the problem is. She's just kind of pointing as if she wanted him to follow up the road. He has to physically insert himself between the two guys to separate them. Get on the ground now! And then orders them to remain on the ground. Two Adam 38, start me some extra units as soon as you can. He's calling for backup. Do not move, you understand me? looks over and in one of the doors open into the townhouse and he sees somebody dead lying on the floor in a pool of blood within a half hour lieutenant joe kenda arrives at the scene and what appears to be a late night party gone horribly wrong hey lieutenant how you doing so we got our victim's a 22-year-old, uh, Philip Titus. He was shot and already deceased when I arrived on scene. Any idea we shot him? No, there's two guys fighting when I pulled up. Uh, 
and separate them when they want. On the coffee table are a set of tattoo needles and tattoo ink bottles of various color. Tattoo artists are very talented. This is freehand art of great detail on human skin. They have a technique that is unique to them. The body's just a canvas. And the artwork that they have on them is just like an artist that would be painting something. Kenda turns his attention toward the victim, Philip Titus. He has a blood-soaked towel wrapped around his head. Take a look. Sure can. His eyes are open. The fact that his eyes are open indicate instantaneous death. And she looks at me, and then she looks at Dave. 
Well, David, you and I need to have a long talk. We're talking to Cindy Davis about the events of the evening. She reports that a play fight became a real fight. Tattooing got spilled, and the fight continues, and a gun gets involved. Right now, signs point to Dave Pinello, the man who earlier tried to prevent police from searching his apartment. So we need to separate him from this group and talk to him individually. Dave, I'm Lieutenant Kenda. I need to tell me what happened tonight. And then I drank way too much. No way. This is my, my best friend. I've never heard him. So I said, well, David, help me with something. Why do you hesitate to sign a search waiver to allow the police to look in your house? Is there something in there you don't want us to find? I was worried about the gun. I guess it's kind of illegal. I didn't register it. So the gun is yours? Yes. Yes, it's my gun. I bought it on the street. I didn't mean for anybody to get their hands on it. Are you going to charge me with possession or something? He was very concerned for the fact that he didn't have it, quote, registered. But the reality at that time was there was nothing illegal in his actions. Firearms were not required to be registered with the police department. Dave may be off the hook for a firearms charge, but he's still a prime suspect in the murder of Philip Titus. And you use that gun to kill Philip tonight? No, that's, that's not what happened, man. No, just chill out. Come on, Phil grabbed me up off the chair, right? And... We're, you know, we're wrestling and we're just messing around. All right, bro. Whoa. 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 Seriously, guys? And he knocks over the table with the tattoo equipment on it. Jeff becomes very upset with that. Jeff, I'm sorry, man. What the hell? Hey, Jeff. Hey, I'm sorry, man. Phil, what the hell, man? Calm down. All right, all right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hey, what the f***? Dave claims that even though Philip took the roughhousing too far, Jeff's reaction only made matters worse. He says that Jeffrey is so angry that his tattoo ink has been spilled and his needles have been scattered. Hey, sorry. Sorry. What the f***? Damn. I'm sorry. Calm down. It's, Look, it's, it's really all the paper deals. You're fine. Really There's not even a mess. Come around. You can even spill anything. Hey, 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 and he's saying things like, I could kill every one of you. Oh, come on, guys, this isn't funny, man. You, worthless piece of s***, calm down, Jeff. It was an accident. We didn't get the gun. Any then, according to David, Jeff unloads the gun, takes the two live bullets out, and he puts one back in, closes it, cocks the hammer, and says to the victim, you've got a 50-50 chance. <laughs> then he puts the gun to his forehead and pulls the trigger. And kaboom. And Philip is dead before he hits the floor. Dave's statement about his tattoo kid in back over. It's me, man. It was, it was just like... It's like $40 worth of equipment. All right. Hang out here for a little longer. In the homicide business, when you have a simple killing, it's called a grounder. Your killer hits a ground ball to the shortstop, and they throw him out at first. And that's what this has become. It's a grounder. Jeff, step over here. Put your hands your back. You're under arrest for murder. Jeffrey Walker, you're under arrest for murder. We handcuff him and take him out. Candid needs to find out why Jeff would murder Philip over what amounted to an accident. So Jeffrey is not only cooperative, but amazingly honest. He is advised of his rights, he waves. He admits it. Yes, I shot him. And then he explains why. I was working on this tattoo, right? It's a really beautiful piece. A lot of detail. Putting it on a friend's arm. And, uh, I mean, we've been at that thing for weeks. Tonight, 
was putting on the finishing touches. It's really delicate, really fine, really detailed work. And then here I am, focused on my art in the zone, really into it. These f- idiots ruin everything. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Well, it's a tattoo. That's going to be a permanent mistake. It's not something that you can wash off. They have ruined his artwork. The ultimate sin. Preventing a tattoo from being correctly done. Jeez, it's not like that big of a deal. Let me take a look. Let me see that thing. Get the f*** back, man. Just calm down. What's your choice? Jeff admits he was beyond furious when he went for the gun, but swears he never intended to kill Philip. He came at me. He asked me to shoot him. You're not a good tattoo artist, dude. He says that Phil taunted him, saying, why don't you just shoot me? And he ignored him initially. But they'd all been drinking, and Phil wouldn't stop. Come on, let's see it. Let's see you shoot me. Come on, Jeff, see what you got. Hey, you can't even do it. Do it. I dare you. suspects there's still more to the story. Sure enough, Jeff admits his contempt for Philip had been brewing for months. He can ink a tattoo, but he's not a real artist. He's a thief. He just copies everything I do. Copies? Yeah. I've never seen him put an original piece on anybody. A trade that you don't steal drawings from other tattoo artists. All right, I'll get a pen of paper and write that up. Whatever. Jeffrey Walter pleads guilty to second-degree murder and is sentenced to 26 years in prison. 26 years in prison is a big price to pay for a moment of rage that spirals out of control. It's probably, for Philip's family, not ever going to be enough because they're never going to get him back. You have a sad formula. Take a gun, add an egotistical attitude, Mix it all thoroughly with alcohol. Put this on a low simmer, and you wind up with one dead tattoo artist. An army veteran killed with a single bullet. I think he shot himself. Really? Would a suicidal person shoot themselves in the chest? A hidden clue leads Lieutenant Joe Kenda through a tangled web of sex and intrigue. She is someone of interest to me. Why do you behave like this? Why do you dress like this? But who is really pulling the strings? I didn't know he had a gun. I can't prove Glenn did anything other than he's got dope in his house. Are they trying to lead us down the wrong path? The three most common motives for murder, money, sex, and revenge. That's starting to work for me. Anytime you talk to anyone in a murder case, particularly one who says they know all about this, you always take that information with a jaundiced eye. Why are you so willing to lay this off on somebody other than you? Maybe you had a part in this. There's one thing that never changes. Murder. A life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. One thirty a.m. It's a warm night in Colorado Springs. John Carson, an EMT here in town, was sleeping. <laughs> When he hears a frantic knock on his front door. You know, when somebody bangs on your door in the middle of the night, the first thing you think of is, am I in danger? When he looks out the people, he sees his neighbor covered in blood. Curtis is hurt. John is an EMT, has some medical training. His neighbor knows this. John grabs his stuff and runs to William's apartment. <laughs> sees a man lying on the floor. Blood was everywhere. <laughs> CPR. Call 911. Gonna lose him. 
It's not working. He has, he has conducted a CPR on the victim. He realizes this is not working. He needs help, and he needs help now. He's not going to make it. In a quiet suburban neighborhood just outside of town, Lieutenant Joe Kenda hopes his workday is finally coming to an end. I had come home that night late from a call, and I woke up one of my dogs, who was a little bitty guy named Fritz. He wanted to go to town, and there were coyotes who are predators. And Fritz is just the right size to get taken by one of them. So I would always watch him when he was out. Damn it. Fritz! Fritz, come on, boy! Come on in! Quiet area. Okay. So what do we got? A single male gunshot wound to the chest. When I arrived, I'm told that Curtis Ashley, who's a 28 year old man, had been removed by ambulance and was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. Curtis Ashley was a kind soul that had a good heart. Somebody who had just gotten out of the service and was getting ready to start his civilian life and see where that led. Family units. two. William and Sheila here. The two individuals that were present at the scene were William and Sheila. This was their apartment. They had allowed the victim to uh, stay with them and had been staying with them for approximately three to four weeks. You want to talk to her now? No, I'm with the crime scene first. When I walk into this apartment, I look at, of course, the blood stain, which is enormous, and it's on a futon-type sofa. We're assuming this is where the victim was crashing. He didn't do much sleep at the night, did he? There is a large amount of blood. It's soaked through the cushion on the futon. It's obviously a gunshot wound. High velocity, blood spatter. These only produced by a gunshot wound. So, obviously, he's there on the bed when he takes this bullet. I got bone fragments here. Unless a bullet strikes a body where the skin is directly over bone, for example, the forehead, bone fragments will not be part of the blowback. It will all be pushed forward by the bullet. So even though that body's not here, the bone fragments tell me there was an exit wound. Well, killed this man, and we have to know his point of origin. I noticed something in the drywall that might be a bullet hole. And here it is. When I shine the light through that hole, I can see that there is a base of a slug lodged in a stud inside the wall. That is probably the fatal round. Yeah, we're going to need that bullet. We're going to have to cut through that drywall to get at it. Whatever you got to do. Yes, sir. We will go to any length to include any level of damage to a property to recover those projectiles. Hey, look at this. That's 380. Go ahead and bag it. Could that be the gun that was used? Of course, it's here, and it's very close to where all this blood is. We need to get this gun fingerprinted. If this gun fired the deadly round, a clean print could immediately identify the killer. The guy was shot here. He definitely didn't die here. We got a blood trail going down the hallway. It's William Seal's room in the back. Why would a guy give his last bit of life to go down this hallway? What exactly is he doing? Does he get up? And does he maneuver down this hallway, getting blood from his wound on these walls? Is he looking to get away from who did this? 
For answers, Kent turns to the couple who lives here. I arbitrarily select William Parks as the first guy for me to talk to. Are you going to take him here? So, what's your relationship with Curtis Ashley? Uh, we're friends. He said that Curtis had fallen on some hard times, him and his girlfriend had broke up, and he had no place to stay, so we let him stay in his apartment for a couple of weeks. What happened here tonight? Well, uh, we had all gone off to bed. Me and Sheila were sleeping at around 1 a.m. We heard a gunshot. What was that? Ashley leaning against the door frame, saying, Please help. Pete turns to return to the living room and literally falls face first onto the floor. Now, William is awake, and he turns on the light, jumps out of bed, and sees a large hole in Curtis's back. So it's just you, your wife, and Curtis in the apartment where the shooting happened? Yes, sir. What do you think happened here? Well, he, he had been sleeping in his gun. So sleep with many things. Very few people sleep with a gun. That really piqued my interest when he said that. Do you think he accidentally shot himself in his sleep? Yeah. He couldn't think of any other reason why Curtis would have been shot other than an accidental shooting. Stay here. Is it possible he shot himself in the chest with a semi-automatic pistol while he's in bed accidentally? Yeah, possible. Is it likely? No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Hoping for an account that better suits the facts, Kenda turns to William's common-law wife, Sheila. Sheila, what's that intended? I ask her the same kinds of questions I ask William, and I'm getting the same answer replied. Yeah, he was a really great guy. We really liked him. But he was kind of going through a lot, so we were trying to help him out. But then she says something completely different than her common-law husband. What happened here tonight? I think he shot himself. Excuse me. He was really depressed. He had this girlfriend, Hannah, and she just broke up with him. I was trying to, you know, cheer him up a little bit. You know, convince him things were going to get better. Okay? No. What's going on? It's Hannah. It's everything. She further said he had just discovered a few days earlier that Hannah had already jumped into a relationship with somebody else. He therefore believed he had not only been discarded, but he had been forgotten. Would a suicidal person shoot themselves in the chest? That is a very rare thing. Suicidal people want to make certain this is going to work. They shoot themselves in the head. You and your husband are telling very different stories. Stay right here. What I focus on is what is likely. Not what's possible. This is getting curiouser and curiouser. The more we ask and the more we learn, the less I like this. Kenda's suspicions only deepen when he hears back from CSI. Hey, Lieutenant. CSI pulled a bullet out of the wall behind the bed. What's the caliber? It's a 45. Now, the gun we covered from the base of the bed is the 380. Can a 380 fire a 45 caliber bullet? No, it can't. Were any other guns recovered? No, sir. Just the victims. That bullet, that piece of lead stuck in a wooden stud, says there is no suicide. There is no accident. This is a murder. And who is present in this room that's still alive? Ashley, who was shot at his residence. Curtis's roommates, William Parks and Sheila Conway, claim Curtis shot himself. But a 45 caliber bullet recovered from the wall suggests otherwise. That bullet says this is a murder. Are they trying to lead us down the wrong path? They're our best leads at this point. They're also our best suspects. I need to talk to the two of you. Either one of you own a gun? Curtis's gun isn't the one that killed him. This wasn't a suicide. This isn't an accident. 
is the murder. You killed him. Is that somebody you? Is that why you're lying to me? So what's that talk about? William understands all of a sudden that this is going south on him and his common-law wife. Now they become really distressed. You think it's us? That we did it? Tell me, it wasn't us. We really are trying to lean on them as possible suspects, but they're adamant about they're not involved. Are you interested in proving you didn't shoot Curtis? If there's a test we can do on your hands, it'll show if either one of you shot a gun. Sheila and William agree to submit to a gunshot residue test. But GSR test is the only way to determine if they've fired a gun. There's going to be a certain amount of smoke, unburned powder particles, and various other chemicals that come out of the weapon and onto the hand of the shooter. If you fire that gun, there's going to be a result. And it's going to say yes or no. The GSR test confirms that neither William nor Sheila fired a gun that evening. The results are negative, Lieutenant. Neither of them? Neither of them. Thank you. So it's apparent that we now have a third person, unidentified, who somehow came into this apartment in the middle of the night and shot and killed Curtis Ashley and then left. So we checked for any signs of force entry? Yeah, we did, but nothing. Nothing on doors or windows. Sometimes I forget to lock up. I'll see who's available. Start a canvas. At this point, we're going to be contacting neighbors. They're probably our best leads. It's early in the morning. We're going to be waking people up, but we need to do that to find out if there's anybody out there who heard or saw anything that would help in this investigation. Real guns are real loud. They are startlingly loud. This is a 45 caliber weapon. It's going to go cop. So when we conduct our neighborhood follow-up, we turn a guy. Nice. Individual, his name is Dale Drummond. He tells us he hears a gunshot, and he is immediately awake. Now I've got somebody here with some information. We're down at the end of the hallway. It may have been close to 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning before I talked to a detective, but um, it was not one of those nights that you could go back to sleep. Hey, I'm Lieutenant Kendall. Dale Drummond. Yeah. So you saw something? Yeah, I heard gunshot. <laughs> Me up from a dead sleep can freak me out. I have a familiarity with guns, so when I heard it, I knew pretty much right away what it was. No evidence. A dog started freaking out in the backyard. <laughs> he looks out in the yard, he sees two humans. Silhouettes only, it's dark, he has no outside light in his backyard. And they're stealing a six foot fence. He can't even describe them because of the darkness. But when they're scaling the fence, he one of them say, hurry up, let's get out of here. And it's a male voice. Then over the fence they go, into the car, and gone. That's all I can tell. Dale's tip gives detectives a much-needed break. So now, we don't only have a Mr. X. Mr. X is a friend. It can be good that there is more than one involved. Catch one, you catch the other one. Thank you. Based on Dale's statement, we're very interested following the path that these individuals may have taken, looking for physical evidence, anything that might help in this case. Dale said he saw the guy's wool fence somewhere here. That six-foot privacy fence doesn't sound like a formidable obstacle, but in reality it is. You do a lot of scrambling before you actually get over this thing. Should be some scuff marks or damage when they went over. Yeah, look at this. Right here. There's fresh scuff marks on the fence. Pretty much gives us exact location where they went over. Hey, Doc. A piece of a wristwatch, maybe? Tag it. Now, somebody goes over the fence. They're grabbing. They're grabbing with anything they got. Did they break their watch? I think so. Let's see if we find the rest of the watch around here. Now, we look for a watch. We don't find one. But we've got the watch strap. That could be but a watch strap isn't all the two suspects left behind. Hey, Lieutenant. Got something for you. On the other side of the fence, we actually find a package of cigarettes. Uh, a generic brand packet of cigarettes. Generic brand cigarettes are less expensive than the named brands of cigarettes. Let's look at this with the cheap stuff. They definitely left here in the last day or so. 
bullet be fucking laid out here in the grass. We had to begin with. Maybe we can turn this pack of cigarettes and that watch band into two dudes. Wouldn't that be nice? Then, as luck would have it, a new lead falls right into Kenda's lap. Propaganda. We get a call that there's somebody at the police station who says that he's a good friend of Curtis Ashley's and he thinks he might know who's responsible for this. Well, this is getting better by the number. 10 4 will be right there. Ken out. Want to keep searching? Let me know if you find anything else. Yes, sir. Let's go. This is Gary Cobalt. Hi, Gary. Hi. Have a seat. Thanks for coming in. I understand you have some information about the murder of Curtis Ashley. His ex-girlfriend did it. Well, that's a pretty direct accusation. Uh, why don't you explain that, Gary? How do, why do you think that's the case? Hannah and Curtis fought all the time. I can't live like this anymore! They're always breaking up, you know, on again, off again. But this last time they broke up, she was telling everyone she put a contract out on them. Really? She said, I want that son of a bitch dead. He further explains that he is well aware that Hannah is friends with violent gang members and that therefore he believes that she has the ability to perhaps carry out a specified murder for hire with Curtis being the victim. Curtis was so terrified he started sleeping with a gun. Well, no. He was sleeping with a gun, wasn't he? You're going to ask you an odd question. Okay. What kind of cigarettes do you smoke? I used to tell my detectives, I don't trust anybody. I don't trust my mother, and she's been dead for 11 years. No, I don't, I don't smoke. Ever had? No. So Hannah obviously becomes the focus of our case. Could it be that Hannah had this guy killed? Yes, it could. The femme fatale. Not enough, of course. But now we have a point of focus. A witness, a broken watch, and a pack of cigarettes lead Kenda to believe two men killed Curtis. But now Kenda suspects a scheming ex-girlfriend may also be involved. We have Miss Anna Tracy, who is alleged to be the mastermind of Curtis's death. She's right next to We want to find out, is she involved in this? Did she do this? opens the door in this low-cut jumpsuit affair. Can I help you? I'm Lieutenant Kenda, this is Detective Ritz. We're investigating the death of Curtis Ashley. Of course you are. Come in. She knows why we're there. She knows that we're coming. She's not surprised that we're there. Nice to see you. Water, maybe? No, thank you. She is someone of interest to me. Why do you behave like this? Why do you dress like this? Please. I'm not going to beat around the bush. So people told us she put a contract out on Curtis. Now Curtis ends up dead. I just said I had a contract on Curtis. Do I really look at that kind of girl? Look, detectives, it's a long story. Did you know Curtis was a drug addict? Well, no, I didn't know that. So I asked her to explain what he meant a drug addict. Well, he used and he sold, and he sold so he can use. We were always broke. That's why I kept breaking up. Curtis! Curtis! Are you serious? Baby, what do you want from me? I swear to God I'm trying to quit. The minute you say drugs and then you say dead guy, this is an enormous complication when they're both uttered in the same breath. And the guys you have money to? Started coming around here, roughing him up, threatening me. You know I'm good for the money, man. If you don't pay me, you are a dead man. Is this why you were together or after you broke up? Both. Anyway, I figured if I started telling everybody I had a hit on Curtis, and those guys who were after him, they'd know we weren't together anymore. And that I wasn't someone they wanted to mess with. Hannah's concerned for her own welfare, so she's building a protective wall through threats, or veiled threats, to try to get these people to leave her alone. After we listen to her, it becomes apparent to me that this is not Hannah, the contract murderer. 
There are now a lot of different reasons why he might be killed. If he was dealing drugs, was he dealing with the wrong person? Did he keep somebody? Well, assuming your story is true, can you think of anyone that would want Curtis dead? Probably Panhead Glenn. You know, Glenn went for drugs. Panhead Glenn? Now, Panhead was a design of a Harley Davidson motorcycle engine. Glenn is an owner of a Panhead Harley. Hence, they call him Panhead Glenn. He says that Glenn is an ex con. He's done time for shooting people in the past. Well, that's interesting. Not only does he have maybe a reason to be mad at Curtis, but he has experience. So, how do you know Panhead Glenn so well? Well, we kind of had a thing for a while. Had or have? Well, you know, feelings, they come and they go. It's weak. He helped me out moving some stuff. We even talked about getting a drink soon. So you think about getting back together with him? I like this mix. The three most common motives in murder, money, sex, and revenge. We have money, and now we've introduced sex. That's starting to work for me. Okay, well, thank you for your help. And I'm sorry for your loss. So we turn to leave, and she follows us outside. And she turns to me, and she's trying to be cute. And she asks me, Hey, do you have a light? She pulls out a pack of cigarettes. I'm very curious about that. She doesn't know I was curious about it. Yes, I do. But it's not the generic brand that's found in that backyard, it's a major brand. No problem. I let her cigarette on me and moved on. Kenda isn't sure he believes all of Hannah's story, but it rings true enough to turn their attention to the man known as Panhead Glenn. Glenn Sapp. Did time for first degree assault. You want to pay him a visit? Let's go check with narcotics, see what we got him first. Convicts don't respond out of fear, they only respond out of pressure. We want to put ourselves in a position where we've got some kind of a hammer on Penhead before we ever talk to him about Curtis Ashton. Hey, Stanley. Hey, Lieutenant, how you doing? Good. You guys know a guy that goes by the name of Bob Penhead Glenn? As a matter of fact, we do. We've got an active investigation of this guy right now. He's a player. He doesn't move a lot of weight, but he moves some. Yeah, we're looking at him for murder. You guys got anything on him that uh, we can use? Enough for a search warrant. They have enough to get a search warrant for his house to find drug evidence. And if it is found in his home, he's arrested for it. This is excellent pressure. That is terrific news. All right, you want to get on that? Want to get the SWAT team a call? Sounds good. All right, thank you. The Narcotics Division agrees to collaborate with Homicide and conduct a surprise visit to the home of Panhead Glenn. Anytime you conduct a, a raid involving narcotics, you take a, a lot of people with you, so there's no resistance, and you take a dog, because it's a lot easier to use the dog, rather than spend all night in there trying to find something the dog can find in 30 seconds. Excellent. Arrest him. Chad, find you back. Well, 
all know. So the search continues. But nonetheless, he's in possession scheduled to control substance. It's a felony. And he is a parolee. And now, therefore, we own him. He's arrested and charged. As the canine team sweeps the final room of the house, the dog detects something else of interest. As they approach one of the bedrooms, the dog just goes crazy. Lieutenant, I think we got something else in here. There's a pile of dirty laundry on the floor, and it starts to move. Not bad of here, There's someone underneath there. You better come out now. Else for you. 
got a watch with a broken old buck. Ooh, I like that. The officer tells Kenda the watch was found on Derek Peters' dresser. Oh, that's perfect. I need to bring that down here immediately. Yes, sir. I'll send it right over. So we have found the part of the watch that wasn't attached to the fence in Curtis Ashley's neighbor's backyard. That's a key piece of evidence to tie him to this case. So, Derek, last night your wife said uh, you and Glenn went out? Yeah, we went to the carnival. Okay. You know, went on some rides, walked around, had some drinks and came home. I didn't find out about Curtis Ashley until the next day. All right. The only way you get a confession is pressure. When you apply the pressure and you continue to obtain the screws, that's when you get somewhere. Do you want to watch there? You see what the band broke. that buckle and his mind is racing where'd you get that because this we found in your room and that we found stuck in a fence back curtis ashley's apartment we're looking at you for this murder i said derek you know where this is going you're going to jail maybe for a very long time he drops his head and starts looking at the floor this is the moment you wait for. Surrender. Emotionally, he has surrendered. We now know that Derek and Gladys Sapp are responsible for the death of Curtis Ashley. No longer a mystery. So now, we need Derek to tell us that, and he's about to. Tell me what happened there. She had a gun. Okay. That's good. Tell me how it started. Well, we went to the carnival. We had a couple drinks. Man, Curtis is really pissing me off, man. Yeah? He's owed me money for months now. Always got an excuse. Yeah, he stole a scum. Damn right. He gets more and more distressed, and he starts telling Derek how he can't let this go, because if he does, the word gets out there that you don't have to pay Glenn, because Curtis never paid Glenn. So he says, while they're there, they're drinking, they're talking about this, they see Anna there. Hey, Anna. Hey, guys. Hey, yourself, sweet thing. And she's important to him. Her affections are important to him. Do you know where Curtis is? We need to talk to him. Yeah, I saw him earlier today. I thought you two weren't talking. Well... Glenn believes that Hannah hates Curtis. Well, she doesn't. And she's playing with Glenn's emotions. She says, we're in a better place now, and we're fine. And Glenn is like, what? Look, I don't want you talking to him. Glenn is already upset, and now Hannah shows up and pours gasoline on the flame. Look, I gotta go. My kids are waiting on me. You see you tomorrow? Maybe. Glenn and his sons, they're gonna go over there and confront Curtis. Derek's opinion is they're gonna get the money, and then Glenn's gonna calm down, and they're gonna leave. That's what he believes is gonna happen. The apartment door was unlocked, and they actually just walked in. Who's there? Glenn sees that there's a gun. And he immediately fires one shot. And they run. They do what fear drives you to do. They run. I believe that Derek never thought 
that Glenn was going to take things that far. And maybe Glenn didn't think he was either. I think the combination of the emotion, the presence of a gun in proximity to Curtis, made everybody react, and a shot is fired. One shot, not multiple shots, one. With Derek Peters' statement in tow, prosecutors elicit a confession from Glenn Sapp, who admits to killing Curtis Ashley over a drug debt. Though he Derek was sentenced to four years in prison. Glenn was subsequently charged with accepting to murder, pled guilty to that, and was sentenced to eight years in prison. Curtis Ashley lives on this planet for 28 years, not 29, because he loses his life over a drug debt, and they presume involvement with a female. And who is Hannah? Well, Hannah is a musician. She's plucking everybody's strings and making noise, but it's not music. It was clearly Hannah's intent to stir the pot with a radioactive spoon between Glenn Sapp and Curtis Ashley. Can we charge Hannah with anything? No. Was she one of the movers in this affair? Absolutely. Grave is a bad word. 
Yeah, nice side. I'm not going home. 10 4 by the way. Get out. Stabbing, male mid 30s, EMTs are transporting him over to St. Francis. The victim is identified as 36 year old Charles Walker. Charles was a veteran. He had fought for his country in Vietnam. He was trying to better his life, going to college, starting a new job. I mean, everything was on the right track for him. He's got multiple wounds chest, abdomen, groin, upper thigh. It is a Hoffman referred to as a blitz attack. Blitzkrieg, lightning war, a term brought to us by the Germans in World War II. Someone is frantically attacking with a knife. Any suspects? Yeah. Patrol's gonna leave Hines secured over there. She did dial 911, but she's absolutely covered in his blood. The majority of violent crime occurs between people who know each other. So I'm very suspicious of Miss Hines. I'll talk to her after I check out the scene. Right this way. at the furniture, I look at the objects in the place, nothing's out of place. But Kenda's attention is immediately drawn to the blood-soaked couch against the far wall. The bloodstains I see look appropriate for someone who has already been wounded to lay down on this sofa and bleed. Have gone through the rest of the house? Any signs of blood? We checked. All the walls are clear of any spatter. So it wasn't stabbed in the house. Given as much blood as this person has lost, then there's got to be a blood trail. Where did the blood trail lead? We can find out without talking to anybody. Trusty flashlight. Light the place up. That's where the EMTs got them. So we've got more blood going that way. Look at the blood on the sidewalk. Followed across the grass because it's still fresh. It hasn't dried yet. So we're following that trail, and there is drainage bleeding in the grass and down a fence. So it's obvious to me that whoever did this did it right here. Looks like we had a footprint. There are sneaker prints in the blood and the dirt adjacent to where the stabbing probably occurred. Now, I do not know whether the shoes worn by the victim produced these, but it could also be that they have some other connection. The woman was in the house? He hides? Yeah, she said anything about a confrontation with Mr. Walker? I don't know how far patrol got in talking to her. So I'm looking at this evidence. This didn't happen in this house. But what if the disturbance happened in the house? What if the woman picks up a knife and announces she's going to cut him high, wide, and continuously? And this is where she catches up to it. And then, overcome by the moment, oh my God, what have I done? Helps him back home and then calls 911. I can see how this could work. At this point, the person that may have the best information of which interests me is this woman, Lee Hines. Science, you step out, please. When the police asked me what Charles had done that night, I told them I did not know. She has got a great deal of blood in her clothing and her person and her hands. Before you say anything, I know what you're thinking. Oh, really? The blood that's all over her is obviously from the victim. So if you have blood all over you, 
then you require a substantial explanation of why you look the way you do. I didn't attack him. Oh my god! Oh my god, what happened? She has an explanation about the blood. Is it reasonable? Yeah, it could be true. But it could also not be true. So, we'll see. Right, we'll start from the beginning. Tell me what happened tonight and how your boyfriend came to be stabbed. I told them that Charles was not my boyfriend. He was a friend of mine that I was helping out. He was my roommate. Now that dramatically changes my perspective. If you're not involved with him, it is less likely that you would engage in violent crime. Charles was close with his family, but they did not live in Colorado Springs, so he didn't have their support. That's why I let him stay with me while he got on his feet. We came from Albuquerque, and he was in the military and in Vietnam. He was working really hard to put himself through school, and I just, I just can't believe that this is it for him. Lee comes across to me as very truthful, very emotional. She cares about him as a person. I've decided, at least for now, she's not part of this. At the moment, though, Lee Hines had the sole witness. So tell me what happened. This is all my fault. I should have never told her about that guy. She says that to me, and I said, oh, really, what guy would that be? Vietnam veteran named Charles Walker who's in the hospital in critical condition and his roommate has just informed me she might know why and she might even know who. Tell me what happened Lee. It was around 2 a.m. There was this really loud party next door. Charles wasn't even home yet and I got up to get a glass of water and I looked out my window. She sees this guy. He's sitting there yelling at everybody. Shut the f*** up! <laughs> and then he... And then he what? She acted like she didn't want to tell me what else. I said, Miss Hines, I'm, I'm a policeman. I mean, you're not going to tell me anything that's going to embarrass me. What did he do? Then he... believed himself. <laughs> I'll be right there! Oh. I was really mad. I have to go clean that up in the morning. Is this guy one of your neighbors? No, he was just there for the party, I think. Have you ever had any problems with your neighbors? Uh, people through the party? <laughs> no, it's a woman and I think her boyfriend. I'd say hi and how you doing and chit-chat a little bit about what's going on. I never had any problem with them at all and neither had Charles. So tell me what happened uh, after you saw this guy urinating on the side of the house. I just was getting ready to go back to bed and... That's when Charles came home. Oh, hey. Hey, you still up? Yeah. Can't sleep. Yeah, the neighbors in the guest room are pretty loud, huh? Yeah, they're rude, too. Really? Yeah, one of the guys came over and peed on the side of the house. What? You're kidding. Nope. And then he just went out the back door. Was he angry? No. I literally just saw that he just forgot something in his car. He didn't storming out of the house. He'll be right back. That's why I thought he went out to get something that he had left in the car. The party is suddenly over, but Charles doesn't come back. So she goes outside looking for him. There was absolutely nobody on the street. There was nobody next door. And so I went walking down to the left. Charles! Oh my god. Oh my god! Oh my god, what happened? And I saw Charles leaning on the fence. He put his arm around my shoulder and we started to walk back to the house. It was dark and I didn't realize he'd been stabbed. And I called 911. So this guy's like you're on the side of the house. Um, you don't know him, but uh, did you describe him to Charles? I just said that he was wearing a white sweatshirt with the arms cut off, and he was just, just like a big guy. Now, it is 
reasonable to assume that Charles is going to identify who that is by appearance alone and confront it. So the odds are excellent, in my view, that Mr. White Sweatshirt is a guy with a blade. Hoping to attach a name to their new suspect, Kenda and his men head next door where the house party had taken place. Great knock on the door, no response. Try the handle. One of the officers found a flashlight on the door. There's blood smears on it. I'm going out. The reason for entry is the exigent circumstance of could there be someone hurt in here? We want to make certain of that fact. No one is in here dying. Police! Clear. House is clear. No bodies. Nobody's home. Looks like everyone sure lived in a hurry. All right, let's glove up and search the place. When somebody really gets hurt, everybody's first instinct is to run. Because they know the next people that are going to come here are going to be the police. And nobody wants any part of that. Kenda and his team continue searching the house for clues. There's nothing in the bedroom that stands out. Furniture is in the rightful place. There is no blood and nothing is out of order. I'd walk in the bathroom. There's blood in the sink, blood in the hot water, cold water taps. There's blood next to the towel rack. Kendra wonders if the killer tried to wash off the blood evidence before fleeing the scene. Hey, Lieutenant, check this out. The sink has got water and soap suds in it. The water's still lukewarm. And there are knives in the water. Kitchen knives from the knife block. Kenda is confident one of the kitchen knives collected from the sink is, in fact, the murder weapon. Hey, Lieutenant. Go for Kevin. The victim passed away just not too long ago. Copy that, Kenda. When they told me he passed away, I kind of lost it. I'm sad for the family. I'm sad for me that I lost a friend. And it's just sad all the way around. As Kenda's team concludes their initial search of the house, they turn their attention to tracking down the homeowners. Not only can they ID my suspect, the evidence in the house says they've watched him cover his tracks. Let's set up a surveillance on the house. At some point, whoever lives here has got to come back. Yes, sir. You got it. This is their house, and all their stuff is here. And the immediate fear factor will eventually subside. They're going to come back. So the officers are there, but they're not obviously easily seen. Tim, they're going to come? No. Probably not. later. This car turns down the street. There they are. The car stop. Officers run the plates and determine the car is registered to the homeowner. James up! A woman named Debbie Archuleta. Now what? Step out of the car. Face away from it. Step out here. Back here. Stop right here. What's going on? What's your name? My name's Debbie Archuleta. She lives there with her boyfriend, John Martinez. The driver was a fellow named Keith Harris, but he wasn't of interest to us. He didn't appear at that time to have anything to do with us. Why didn't you take a seat in the vehicle? Is everything okay? I'll explain everything in a minute. She is a mature witness and homicide. We're not releasing her. Kenda's men hauled Debbie Archuleta down to the station. In Kenda's office... Debbie vehemently denies knowing anything about the attack on Charles Walker. As far as what happened with the neighbor, I, I heard he got cut somehow. It happened outside. John and I were already inside starting to clean up. Everybody's in the bathroom when the shots are fired. 
Everybody's in the garage when the knife comes out. Nobody seems to know much of anything. So wake you and John get out of there so fast. I've got a couple of kids and I just wanted to get out of there. Run. And that's what she does. She takes your kids, takes your boyfriend, and they beat feet. Debbie, my officers and I have already been inside your house. Yeah. Her eyebrows went up. That surprised her. We found blood. A lot of it. You would know anything about that, would you? I don't know what to tell you. Now we're lying. Before, a little bit of truth here and there. Now we're flat lying. So where's your boyfriend? Where's John? Maybe he can tell us the truth. I don't know where he is, I swear. After we left, he said something about our friend Keith going to drop him off at a relative's house for Easter. Which relative? What's the name? I don't know. He didn't say. Why are you protecting John Martinez? Because you are. How about a guy at the party with the uh, white sweatshirt with the sleeves cut out? Who's he? I think you mean Pete. I don't know his last name. He lives with his parents. identifies himself on the phone as Pete Quintero. He said he was at a party the night before, and he knows that things got out of control, and he knows that maybe he's part of how it started. I was wondering if I could come in and... Excellent, Mr. Quintero. Come on down, Pete. You're the next contestant to this little scenario. Investigating the death of Charles Walker, page 36, and I am finally in contact with Pete Quintero, who to this point in this investigation has been my prime suspect. Mr. Quintero, thanks for coming in. He is anything but a hardened criminal. I heard about the guy getting stabbed, and I told my parents I was at that party, and they told me to contact you guys. Good for mom and dad. So he says he goes to this party, and they're there... Having a good time. Hey, I was in line for the bathroom, and I guess I was kind of drunk. The line's terrible. I'm just, I'm just gonna go on the side of the house. I, I just decided to take a piss on the side of John and Debbie's house, but I just got turned around, and um, I ended up being in the neighbor's house instead. Pretty simple mistake. These houses are incredibly close to you. Yeah. And Charles showed up a few minutes later. Excuse me, man. Can I talk to you for a second? Asking Pete, why did you do that? pissed in my garage door, dude. Pete said he's not calling him names. He's not threatening him. He's actually pretty reasonable about it. I know you're drunk. That's, that's just not cool, dude. If he was your friend, he was very loyal to you. That night he was just being Charles and defending the home front, I guess you could say. Honest, Mr. Kenda, I, I know I shouldn't have been peeing anywhere outside. But I was just really drunk in, and then I said I was sorry, and then it just, and then I really... Relax. It's okay. This is a murder. No one cares about the urination on the garage door, including me. But everybody cares a whole lot about the former Charles Walker, who is now a dead guy. Tell me what happened after you talked to uh, Charles Walker. I mean, he told me that it was okay, and just not to do it again. And then John comes out and they started getting into it a bit. You really pissed on my garage, okay? What are you talking about? You Did they fight? No. Well, I mean, not, not that I know of. I was just really embarrassed, so I left after that. Pete, of course, could still be a suspect in this event, but his general demeanor 
doesn't lead me to think that he's the guy. All right, Pete, I'm going to let you go. But if you get home and realize there's something you haven't told me, it's in your best interest to come back and let me know. Yes, sir. If what Pete Quintero has said is true, Kenda's list of potential suspects has grown substantially longer. Pete says John went back to the house. And there were other people around. What if somebody else decided to take up John's cause and confront Charles as well? Kenda is more eager than ever to track down homeowner John Martinez. But so far, he hasn't been able to locate him. Lieutenant. Hey, Josh. We picked up a guy and he's being arrested for DUI. He's claiming he knows something about who stabbed Charles Walker. So talk to him. All right. I'm introduced to this guy, a Mr. DUI guy, who's still got a little juice in him, but he's coherent. Listen, I'm not telling you guys anything unless you can get these DUI charges dropped, okay? Well, that's not going to happen. But what I can tell you is that you'll be treated fairly and get to stay in peace both here and in court. Okay. He says, I was at this bar, and this guy walks in, and it Guy next to me leans in and says, hey, see that guy? Yeah. What about him? He says, that's Marco Morello. He stabbed the guy at that party the other night. Okay. Okay. That's it. I, I just gave you the name of your killer. And that's his information. Stay put. Let's go around this Marco Morello's name and see what we got on. We got it. It's the kind of thing that informants come up with when they're in a jam. We still have to look into it, but I'm not confident that this is meaningful. But the next day, Kenda receives a surprising piece of information. Lieutenant, this Marco Morello guy, turns out he's got an assault record. But check this out. Apparently, he was involved in another stabbing two days after Charles Walker was killed. Oh, really? Well, maybe Marco is a little more interesting than we thought. this information that Marco Morello is in of Walker's death. Is this guy just like a serial stabber? Or is the second stabbing somehow related to Charles' murder? There's definitely a possibility that Marco could be the killer. So we're going to watch that. Check this. The incident took place right in front of the detective's bureau. What? You be kidding me. And I said, you know, if you're going to stab somebody... Wouldn't you pick a different place to do it than in front of the detective bureau? Okay, sir. Sorry, man, I don't have any money. Uh, you don't think I don't know what you've been telling everyone about me? Excuse me? I've heard it everything. <laughs> Turns out this isn't a stabbing. This is an accusation of menacing with a weapon. If you threaten someone with a gun or a knife or a grenade or whatever, and nobody gets hurt, you've committed the crime of menacing. They arrest Marco, they take his knife away. It's a small pocket knife. Does he have another knife? I mean, knives are easily obtained. So he is an issue we have to look into. He was drunk when they arrested him, so they released him to one of the state places. Maybe he's still there? Good idea. Let's take a ride. With a few phone calls, detectives are able to track down their new person of interest, Marco Morello. Colorado decriminalized alcohol abuse years ago. So drunks found in the street are given to treatment centers. Marco? Marco, I'm listening to Kenda. I need you to tell me everything you know about the stabbing of uh, Charles Walker. Charles Walker? Yeah. Marco comes across as a harmless, pathetic kind of guy. He implies that he has information that no one else but him has. I don't have any real personal knowledge of what happened other than what I read in his autopsy report. It's like, excuse me? Yeah. No one knows about the autopsy report. But as Kenda and Detective Hendricks listen to Marco Morello, they realize he may not be the most reliable source of information. He had all these different wounds from all these different knives. Right? 
Just knife after knife after knife. It's like a million knives all at once, you know? It's crazy. Hi, Mark. Can you excuse this for a second? Yeah, yeah. We walk out of the room and we speak to the Detars concert. Does Mark have a history of mental illness? He's been diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. I think once you find out that somebody, you know, has a mental illness like this, you have to start questioning anything that they told you. How much of this is really real and how much of this is... There is no way this guy did anything to Charles Mark. Or anyone else for that matter. He is not the right guy. That is the end of Marco. With yet another lead evaporating, Kenda is increasingly anxious about finding the elusive John Martinez. According to his girlfriend, is staying with an unidentified relative. The guy that started all this is mysteriously absent from where he's supposed to be. He's not home, and he's not at work. I get very distressed about people who are not where they are supposed to be. Why are you fleeing the police? That's when Kenda comes up with an alternative plan for tracking down his suspect. This is Kenda. Can you do me a favor and locate a Keith Harris? He's the guy that drove Debbie the homeowner back in the morning after the party. The guy that drove her by the house when she was observed by the police is the same guy that drove John to his relative's house hours after the stabbing. So now we need Keith Harris to shed some light on John's involvement in this crime or his lack of involvement. He now represents a key. Within the hour, Kenda is seated in Keith Harris's living room. Look, Debbie came over and then I took her home. But as the two men talk, Kenda gets the sense he's being given the runaround. When she was over here, what'd she say? You know, I don't really know. She said she needed somewhere to hang for a bit, and I said, sure, come on over. Keith Harris has been in custody. He's been in prison. He knows not to ever be a witness. If you don't know, you can't testify. He didn't know nothing about nothing. How about John Martinez? What'd he say when he was here? John wasn't here. You didn't see him at all that night? No, sir. You're lying to protect someone. Somehow or other, I can connect you to this. I'm going to. Is this something you want to go to prison for? It's the pressure. A veiled threat. The only thing that puts anybody forward is fear of their own trouble. Then they suddenly get an improved memory. Well, I guess he was over my house for a bit. Good. What else? I don't know how to say this. He had a... Keith, I'm losing my patience here. Do you want me to call your parole officer and let him know what we're talking about? All right, all right. When he came over, he had blood all over his sneakers. His clean shoes now, dirty. Where is John and his bloody shoes? My experience tells me that John Jacob Martinez is the guy that stabbed Charles Walker to death. And he's got blood on his shoes. And I don't only want to find the shoes, I want to find the dude that's wearing them. Keith has located Keith Harris, who admits that John stayed at his house the night after the stabbing. When he came over, he had blood all over his sneakers. But that's not all. He had blood on his jacket too, like, like on his sleeve. Sorry about this. I got a fight with my neighbor. Did you ask him about it? He said he cut him a few times. You're right, John. You certainly did. The next morning, before I took Debbie home, he asked me to take him to his grandfather's house. I appreciate you being honest with me. No problem. I'll be in touch. same day, Kenda and his men pay a visit to John Martinez's grandfather, but he insists John isn't there. He's obviously lying to protect him. Four days, we look for him, we check with family, relatives, friends, everybody, 
We're always one or two steps behind him. Kenda is running out of patience. And finally, after all the searching, locates John's mother, Gloria. It's Martinez. Kenda's approach this time is to put the fear of God into her. You and I both want what's best for your son. You need to convince him to turn himself in. This isn't going away. And we leave it at that, and we wait. We don't have to wait. It's Kenda. Hello, Mr. Kenda. John's here with me now. He's going to surrender peacefully. If he doesn't go anywhere, I'll be right there. Okay. Kenda and his men race back to the Martinez home. John looks like a little kid. He's frightened. Jim Martinez? I'm not talking. You call that guy. His mother got him an attorney, and he says upon advice of counsel, he's not going to make a statement. That's fine, John. can do that. He's wearing his sneakers. And I can see blood on his shoe. We book you to the jail. We have to swap out your clothes and your shoes for a jail jumpsuit. Sure, whatever. In his mind, he's already destroyed all the evidence. Well, actually, there is still a problem, John, that you didn't consider. Once John Martinez has been booked into custody, Kenda sends his clothes to the forensic lab for processing. The blood on his shoes match the general type. Antigen levels of the victim. Done. Deal. With the physical evidence linking John Martinez to the murder of Charles Walker, Kenda reaches back out to the man caught urinating on the house. Pete Kinter the more I think about it, the more Pete's story sounds too convenient. He leaves right before everything spirals out of control. Pete, unless you want to be named as accessory to murder after the fact, you better start talking. Pete now knows, because it's all over the news, that John Jacob Martinez has been arrested. He knows that the plan of pushing away any suspicion from John is over. Okay. Well, like I said before, John and Charles were getting into it, and then John went back at the house, right? Then John comes back out, and he has a knife. No, I don't keep playing And I swear that is when I left because I, I could tell where things were heading. Why are you running? Are you scared of me? He chases him until he catches up to him. <laughs> and he hooks him with that blade. <laughs> Why does he do all that? Who knows? He's got a few drinks in him, and he's got a bad temper, and maybe that's all he needs for motivation. John runs back to the house, and the case unravels from there. In a few minutes' time, someone's dead, other people's lives are changed forever, and over what? Over nothing, really. I really have no understanding as to why everything escalated so fast other than the fact that my neighbors were all of a sudden went crazy at trial john martinez is convicted of first degree murder and is sentenced to life in prison i lost a friend of mine to violence unnecessary violence he would do anything he could to help you out. And he was an all-around nice person. If this hadn't happened, I think Charles would have gone out and, and graduated college and would be having a successful life. Charles Walker had survived 36 years on this planet, and he dies over a meaningless act at a party. Does that make any sense? 
No. Murder never done. 人，我操！哎，真不好说，这不这不是一个级别的。那个，哎，这二百不算贵，比北京那便宜。哎，我跟北京跳那个，就刚才你们看那视频，那是一个小湖，你知道吧？那个小湖，你给人感觉吧，反正也挺吓人。我操，这他妈面对整个大海，从屋子那往下跳，远处，哎呦，我操，那质感、啊，妈，吓死个人呀！吓死个人呀、啊！这公安体验是什么？啊，玩三 D 啊！啊，这是玩三 D， 穿越，穿越瞬间发生。喝的嘛，来一瓶喝的。这屋子这有风。哎呦，我别去，我别去。我我。这索道赚钱，这东西基本我都没人玩基本是没人玩儿。